Here's what it means. It means you to come over here and take your oath from your clerk. Joseph means. Very well. All right. Thanks, sir. Welcome to Lexington. You didn't have to go to Bike Week either, huh? Yes, sir. <laughs> All right. Solicitor, you're a witness, too. Thank you, and, um, Detective, you're still on note. Sergeant Preach, I've been talking about your interview with Defendant Mr. Jones on September 8, 2014. And I think when we broke, we talked about the number of lies he made. We covered Walmart. We covered the note. But you also mentioned blood. Yes, I did. What, what was his initial story as to the blood? So he had told officers on the night of the 7th that it was from an animal, and he repeated that to us on the 8th before then saying that it was from a cut. Okay. And eventually, as the conversation went on, finally came off of that as well. He did. Now, before he came off of it and said, let's cut to the chase, he was talking about fear of the kids and the things the kids were saying. You offered up an out for him, one that you thought, I think you had said you kind of pushed it to the limit. What was that? Yeah, so as I previously testified, I offered him a very blatant self-defense argument and I kind of oversold it a little bit, and he reacted accordingly that he thought it was kind of ridiculous. And you mentioned yesterday that his emotions were up and down, a lot of sobbing, a lot of uh, when the photos were laid out, how he reacted. At some point, you mentioned a complete change, and he said what? He said, uh, guys, let's cut to the chase. Watching that emotional change, was that just did that he just fade into that, or how was it? Well, it was it was a pretty sharp turn in his demeanor. I mean, he went from being very visibly upset that it was, I mean, snap your fingers or flip the switch, and he was suddenly in a completely different demeanor. Did that tell you, as an investigator, he could control his emotions? It certainly appeared he was controlling them. Now, you had mentioned at some point the interview was taped. You tried to tape the first part, and it didn't work. I'm sure you state 145. Is that the interview that we went over with Dave Mackey? Correct. This would be the beginning part of that interview. Um, Your Honor, I'm not sure if this was admitted, but I'll admit it now. It was not. Offer it now. And that's exhibit number what, Joy? That's number, state number 145. Is there any So, previous objection, it be admitted. Now, once he said, Mr. Jones said, let's cut to the chase, how was his tone? It was, it was pretty, I'd call it pretty even, um, pretty calm, steady. And when the topic of Natan came back up, you recall him admitting he had pushed Natan too far? Yes, those were his words, that he'd pushed Natan too far. What word did he use to describe Natan's attitude that night towards him? Uh, as I... It's come up in previous testimony, he specifically used the word defiant to describe Natan. And again, he's the little six-year-old. Yes, he would be the six-year-old. Now, do you recall as you and Agent Mackey interviewed him, the 
question being put to him, was this out of fear, or was this because Natan wouldn't come off of it? Do you remember that question? I do. So um, Special Agent Mackey directly asked if it was out of because of fear or because Natan wouldn't come off of it. And Timothy responded, yes, it's because Natan wouldn't come off of it. And was he, as you talked to him, did he appear visibly angered even as he's talking about Natan? Yes, mo most times that Natan would come up, it was clearly a bit of a trigger for Timothy. It would at least irritate him, if not make him appear to be visibly kind of angry. Do you recall him saying something to the fact that if he had just come off of it, none of this would have happened. Yes, he absolutely attributed um, that if Natan had been truthful about this issue with the electrical outlets, that none of the other children would have would have been killed. In fact, Natan wouldn't have been killed. Correct. When he talks about Scooby Snacks, what we now know as Spice, baby Panaka. Did he say he smoked that right before he killed Natan and these kids? No, he was very explicit to say he didn't smoke any beforehand, but he used it afterwards. So when he placed these kids, I'm using the word place, that's my word, in his car, did he mention he used care in doing that? No, he, he said he was not very careful because they were already dead. Did he say he used anything to wrap them or cover them? Yes, he said he used blankets and sheets from the house. Isn't it true? It's not just from the house, but he used the kids' own blankets and sheets from their beds? Uh, yes, it was the blankets and sheets from their beds, hence why the beds were bare once law enforcement searched the house. And he covered them up so he didn't have to look at them? It would appear so that if you looked in the vehicle, you would just see blankets? Yes, uh, they were pretty thoroughly covered. I mean, being small children, large blankets and comforters, they we had to uncover them pretty good later on to see that they were there. And when he says he's driving all over the place, isn't it true, he says when he's doing this, the entire time he's trying to think what's his next step? Yes, he, he mentioned that as he formulated different plans of what, what he was going to do, that this was during his travels. And isn't it true he said basically he's in panic mode? Yes, uh, he described as if his big, big dilemma during this period was what was he going to do with the children and how was he going to get rid of, he used the word evidence. He referred to his kids as evidence? He did evidence is for court. Is that right? Correct. When he went to the Dollar General and bought trash bags and he finally admitted that he did that, do you recall him saying it wasn't just for the kids? Yes, so um, I believe that Special Agent Mackey posed the particular question if the trash bags were purchased for the children and he said yes, but I had other trash to throw away, too, was his response. And when y'all questioned him about the smell of the children's bodies, what did he say about that? He said it smelled like shit. And how, did you ask him, how do you handle that smell? How can you sit in a car and drive? What was his response? He had used a lot of air fresheners and Febreze, I believe, but he said that I mean, the odor was pretty pungent. You couldn't, you couldn't cut that with a whole lot, but he said you just get used to it after a while. And this isn't just a bad smell. This is coming from his dead children. Correct. It, it was clearly a decom decomposition odor. And you just get used to it after a while. That's what he said. At some point it came out that why would you ride around with them? Well, I didn't want to park from them. I wasn't ready to park with my kids. You remember that? Yes, he did um, eventually tell me during our our interactions, our discussions, that the reason it took him a week was because he, he just wasn't ready to let them go. But isn't it true, the night before he did something with these children's bodies, he actually got stopped by law enforcement officers? 
Yeah, so again, that would be the story of him getting stuck in the ditch the night before and almost getting arrested where he said he should have been caught then. So that was a close call. He certainly made it sound like it was a very close call because he said the children were just right there in the vehicle. And if he had gotten caught, he knew he would be in trouble? Correct. And it's then that he acts and gets rid of these children? Yes. Uh, the next morning, they're gone by lunchtime, I guess, for lack of better words. Y'all finally get him to admit everything, and then he's he's uh, now trying to help you find the body. Did he appear that he could focus and be engaged in that process? He did. I mean, he, he became very engaged because, I mean, it was... I think 170, 180 miles from where we were at. So he would have to be pretty focused and engaged to help us do that level of backtracking, especially when he told us that he had tried to be very random and tried to leave them in a place that he wouldn't be able to help us later on. Um, so the fact that he was still able to do that, we thought was pretty remarkable. He's an IT guy, so y'all made sure he had computer access. Yes, we, we had hoped that if he could just even give us a location on a map of uh, general vicinity that we may be able to find him without even having to take him back. And he even asked something about a topographical map, something that could show height and depth. Yes, and um, it was a pretty difficult type of map to find. I don't think we ever found anything that was quite suitable. So during this process, you could actually engage with him and talk technical talk oh, well. um, how to find these kids certainly I, I most most discussions with him I would say were fairly intelligent discussions with you know not necessarily advanced topics but certainly fairly technical discussions at times at any time does he have what might be described as a flat effect just kind of he's just there yeah, I mean, sometimes, I mean, you've heard that on some of the recordings. Um, he does go get very emotional at times, but other times he does have a very, very flat, matter-of-fact effect and demeanor. But when he's matter-of-fact, that's when he was actually confessing, correct? Correct. So it wasn't like there's just nothing there. He actually talks and tells you details. Is that correct? Oh, correct. He was very communicative. It's not like all of a sudden he goes into zombie mode. No, appropriately engaged, um, no shift in focus, just he would go from being upset to very, very flat. But he could turn it on and off. Is that right? He, it certainly turned on and off when we interacted with him. And when he finally was trying to help find the children, by that point, he had nothing to lose, did he? No, and, and I had explained that to him that, I mean, the case was effectively made against him at that point, whether we found the children or not. But, it, you know, I felt like it was important for everybody. Once we knew that they weren't alive, it, it really shifted from a kind of, I guess you could say it went from a rescue mission to a recovery mission. And to me, that was our most important objective at that point was to, to find those children so that um, they could be put to rest and that the family could get some marginal sense of closure. Throughout this process of dealing with him, it, your interaction with him, would you describe it as a little different than Dave Mackey's interaction with him? Yes, and um, it certainly just naturally developed into more, um, he see, saw Special Agent Mackey in a more antagonistic light, I think partially because of his role as an FBI agent and his more direct accusations. Um, so, you know, I kind of began to subtly kind of take advantage of that. I tend to have a more empathetic approach during interviews anyways. Um, I'm very rarely good at being the bad cop, so I ter certainly took advantage to be the being the good cop role in this situation. While he was still denying what happened, when he would be confronted by Agent Mackey, would he gravitate to you? Yes, he would certainly gravitate more toward me in those un uncomfortable moments. Um, but I tended to, I sat pretty close to him, um, kind of facing toward him. I think at one point I even put a hand on his shoulder, kind of giving some physical reassurance because um, just kind of creating that, that bond as we, we spoke.
and that's part of your training. Yeah, it's not as much interview training. Um, I've got a lot of background, um, about eight years in crisis negotiation, so I tend to apply a lot of those um, tactics when I'm interviewing somebody, especially when they're clearly in what I would call a state of crisis. Did it seem important to Tim Jones that you believed him? It did. Um, he, he appeared to be very... Um, our opinion or my opinion specifically appeared to be very important to him. Did it seem important to him that you tell him he's doing the right thing? Yes, and, and that became a, a recurring theme, and, and I, I would reinforce it because at that point, like I said, he had confessed. Um, he, he could have stopped at any point and said, you know what, I'm not taking you guys to these kids. Um, I'm done. Um, <laughs> but at that point, like I said, the big, my, my main objective wasn't him confessing anymore because he'd already done that. It was, it was just really important that we find those children. That whatever I had to do to keep, keep that rapport going, I was going to do that. Because your job wasn't done yet. No, absolutely not. The next day, September 9th, the day that y'all go to Alabama to find these children, you remember, as Agent Mackey said, y'all bring him in in front of all the officers and you say, all right, Mr. Jones, go through this again. You remember that? I do. Um, when he went through that again, the whole incident about what happened August the 28th, that night, when all of these children die or are deceased, as he said, does he ever mention voices? He doesn't. Um, he gives a very basic summary of what took place, um, starting with the ton and the PT incident and him strangling the other four children. Um, but he doesn't mention voices during this. You recall him mentioning for the first time his prescription glasses were broken. He does, and I don't, I don't remember if that was in response to a question or if it just kind of came up as an afterthought, um, but that was the first time he had mentioned that he said Natan had broken a pair of glasses that night that he said cost several hundred dollars, and um, as he mentioned that, he got noticeably angry um, about it. It was still something that he was a little bitter about, it, it appeared. So this is on the day he's doing the right thing to take you to the bodies of his children, and he's still angry at Natan. Correct. Now, obviously, he, you rode with him. Were you were in the back of the vehicle with Mr. Jones on that long ride. I was. He was in the rear driver side, and I was on the rear passenger side. <clears throat> you had the reporter going, and he knew that. Uh, on the way back, we did, yes. Okay. So on the way back, so you get down there. Let me ask you this. You get to that site, and you mentioned something about the bags, one or more of them had tears in them, and you were concerned about animal activity, so you asked him, what did you ask him? If you don't mind, I'd want to review the transcript, so I'm not speaking out of turn. Well, let me ask you, did you ask him if he did something to the bodies that caused those, caused those tears? I did, because even though he had told us um, initially that he hadn't done anything, he later changed that to state that he had tried to saw Natan's leg. So um, we didn't have absolute certainty that we weren't going to get there and find the bags and find the bodies and there'd be findings contrary to what he had probably already said we would find. And he had already mentioned, I guess, the day before about, I don't know any other way to put it, but that portion of the sky that turned out to be Eli. Correct. Um, the bit of scalp tissue that um, Stacy Jones had originally told me about, that I think is the picture I was introduced. Um, we, you know, that was one of the things we had asked about, and he just attributed it to the fact that he hadn't been very careful with the bodies. Why wasn't he careful with the bodies? because they were already dead. And so when y'all got to the site, which is seen in States 160, these bags, and you saw some tear damage to the bags, and you asked him about that, did he say anything about 
you know, maybe it was me. It could have been just because I was careless with the bags. Something to that effect? You know? Yes, I believe he said, um, I don't know, and indicated that his actions could have been responsible. As to that discussion on the way back, with that tape recorder going, this is on the night, to drive him back, take him back to Mississippi. That's correct. Sheriff Crumpton had wanted him to get, get him all back to Mississippi. Yeah, he wanted to get it done pretty quick. <clears throat> You recall Mr. Jones saying, my mind was just put them out and run. It was. That's what he said. You recall him saying, I was just trying to buy time. He did. And again, as to the ripped bags, remember him saying, that was probably me? He did. And then y'all went into that explanation. You remember him saying, I was merciless when I put them in there and threw them around. So, I mean, this was after the fact. You remember him saying that? Yes, I very distinctly recall him using the word merciless. I thought it was a pretty strong choice of words for... And after the fact means what? They were already dead. Remember him going on and saying, I put them into the vehicle mercilessly and threw stuff in there to try to shelter the smell. Remember him saying that? I do remember him saying that. And again, as conversation went on, he said, I was running on time, borrowed, borrowed time. Borrowed time because um, he believed that he was going to get caught at some point. And at some point, the conversation shifted about him and about whether he would do anything to himself. And you remember him saying, I'm not on suicide watch either. I promise you, I'm not going that route. Yes. So a man who's killed his children says he's not going to kill himself. Yes, he uh, explained that for his religious reasons, he believed suicide was a cardinal sin and he'd go straight to hell. But he didn't mention anything about killing your kids being a cardinal sin. No, he didn't. His focus was on him, correct? It was certainly uh, a Timothy-focused dilemma. And then again, for the third time, he mentions how merciless he was with the children when I threw them in. I wasn't exactly nice about it. I just wanted to get out of there. That's what he said. You remember him minimizing what he did to his children when he said, I tried to make it as little suffering as possible. Remember him saying that? Yes, and I believe that was in response to us asking how long it took. Because as Dr. Ross previously testified, uh, suffocation is not, not quick. But he made it sound like it was gentle. Is that right? He made it sound like it was as much so as he could make it. You remember him when he's talking? He says, all I know is that I started acting the wrong way. Remember that? Yes, I do. And all this talk about driving all around, you remember him saying again, when you asked him to kind of explain that, he said, I'm just going to buy time. And he talks about he's trying to make plans. He's planning. Yes. So he had a purpose for his driving. Uh, it appeared that the driving was, you know, I guess anything but being at home. Um, and that's when he formulated all of his plans, bought supplies on various dates, especially there toward the end. At some point, the focus shifts back to Natan. He keeps coming back to Natan, doesn't he? He does. Um, in this conversation, Natan came back up, and he once more centered all the blame for this on Natan. He said something to the effect, I'm reading this right, I think he's trying to get rid of their bodies by mutilating them. 
He said that on the drive back, right? Yes, which would be reflected in the one note where he talked about um, getting rid of the remains. And you asked him, how many bodies did you actually attempt to mutilate? And he shifts back to Natan, and you remember him saying, I just tried with Natan. I tried to saw his leg, and that's about it. Remember him saying that? I do. And you asked why him, and he says, he was just the one I went to because he was the focal point. That six-year-old was the focal point. You remember him saying that? Do he was the focal point, and Timothy's basically attributed to him that he was the one that started all of this and that was responsible. And he says it several times. I mean, he was the whole focal point for this whole thing. Yes. And then he goes on again. I mean, there was other parts too, but he's the focal point. I mean, it's centered around him. Those were his words coming back after seeing these bags with his dead children's bodies in them, right? Yes, that's correct. Then he got into the whole, the DSS stuff that we've heard about with Natan. Yes, we talked about that a little bit. And said Natan had said something to, I guess, the caseworker with DSS. And you remember him saying, basically, Natan and Mira wanted to see their mom and they wanted to go live there. You remember that? Yes, I do. And apparently the case agent told them no. Remember that? I do. He seemed upset about that, didn't he? It seemed to bother him quite a bit. <clears throat> that his kids would choose Amber instead of him. Is yes, and you could say probably next to Natan, Amber was a bit of a button for Timothy. <coughs> and as you drove, and you were talking about uh, Natan, you said, are we gonna find that you strangled him? Remember his words were, I don't think so. <coughs> not absolutely not, but I don't think so. Weren't those his words? Those were his words, which is a pretty unusual response to something that he's fairly adamantly denied up until that point. And again, what he talked about, as this conversation went on, he talked about his plans to get rid of the children, his words. You remember him mentioning, just cut them up and feed them to a hog? That was one of the plans? Yes, that was one of the thoughts that went through his head. And just throw them into concrete. That was another plan? A uh, concrete compressor, yes. And do you remember, right towards the end, he made this statement, can you contact the mugshots, the people that make and handle mugshots for South Carolina, and make sure they don't put me in that? you remember him saying that? Yes, he didn't want his picture in the mug shots. I guess he didn't want the publicity over all of this. Tim Jones doesn't want to look bad, does he? he? Certainly didn't want to be on the news over this. And he's concerned at how society or the public might view him. He was, he was very worried about how he'd be perceived over all of this. And again, you keep telling him, Tim, you've done the right thing. Remember that? I have because um, as we had found the children at that point, but I'll maintain even to this day that it was not to excuse anything he did by any means, but it was the right thing for him to take us to those children because I think at that moment it was the very least he could have done. And it was important for him to keep hearing that from you, right? Uh, it appeared so, and I felt it was important to keep saying it in equal measure. But the last time, this is several days later, after the bodies were recovered, the little children, the bodies were recovered, you mentioned again, Tim, you did the right thing. You remember his response? What do you mean I did the right thing? I killed my fucking kids. Those were his words. Well, yes, uh, it was a, a pretty, pretty harsh response to that. Um, 
this whole time he's talking about, I had no plans. And now I'm just trying to do the right thing. In his car, in his panic, the one thing he, he remembered to take was his passport, States Exhibit 73. In his panic, loading that car up, he took this, didn't he? Yes, I remember seeing the passport in the car. So for all that stuff in his car, this was his ticket to get away. Is that right? Certainly has that appearance. Detective Preach, thank you. Detective Preach, he didn't help to speak with you, did he? He absolutely didn't. He could have told you to go pound sand. You couldn't have gone back to him. Yeah, he could have stiff-armed us from the start if he had wanted to, and we would have had a much more difficult road ahead of us. I'll concede that. And when he talked to you about Natan and, was it Natan and Mira conspiring through DSS? Yes, he did talk about Natan and Mira. And the solicitor asked you about all these plans that the boys was talking him about, but he told you, I couldn't go through with them. Yes, he said he came up with all these plans, but couldn't go with any through with any of them. I think the only one he attempted was the dismemberment when he tried to solve Natan's leg. And he told you once he started that, I, I couldn't go through with that either. Said one could cut, and he threw the saw into the tree line, which we never found. And and solicitor asked you about suicide. I guess your words were being a cardinal sin. Yeah, so he was very explicit that they would be against his religious beliefs. Because there's thought that if you do that, you don't have the ability to repent because you're dead. Correct. He felt like he could be forgiven for everything else short of suicide. And he told you, um, and I think it was on tape, that how Agent Mackey intimidated him. He did. He was um, very intimidated by Special Agent Mackey, which you know, I don't I think he's a nice guy, but I guess I can see how in Timothy's position he would have seen the FBI agent in the mix as intimidating. And the solicitor also asked you about the conversation on the night, um, I believe, with Tim, correct? That was kind of after the next morning, after the 8th? Yes, yes, the one on the 9th. And you didn't record that? I didn't. It was... Um, kind of amidst a pretty rapid strategy session that was mostly law enforcement centric. And I guess your report's what, about 40 pages? Mm, I think I've done north of 70, 75 pages ultimately in this case. And that conversation on the night is a paragraph. It is, because it was, it was pretty brief. And your words are the events, as Timothy once more related them, were entirely consistent with what he told us the night before. Yes, and I was referring to the the basic events. And I probably could have been a little, a little clearer to establish that. And you had Agent Lawrence there who could have polygraphed him on anything that y'all wanted to. He could have, but again, polygraphs are a nice tool, but like I said, I've only seen them used once in my, my 10 years in an active criminal investigation. But the equipment made the trip with you. It did. And I believe you had even said, and he had told you about aimlessly traveling around, correct? He did. And you talked about when you gave him, I guess, the maps or the computers, when he had something technical to do, he could really focus on that, couldn't he? No, certainly. He certainly whizzed through the computer once it was given to him. It, but you said even when he was doing that, I believe your words were that he still had appropriate emotional responses at times. Yeah, because at times he would get choked up and cry. I mean, similar to the responses he's shown in the courtroom through these proceedings, um, I think as anybody would or should in the circumstances. And I think Solicitor also asked you about this point in time where he just stops and says, let's cut to the chase, and, and his demeanor just 
on a dime changed, correct? Yes, it, it was very sudden. We, we were not even expecting it. We thought we were going to eventually get there, but it, he kind of pulled the rug out from under us when he jumped straight into that. But he still ended up um, crying, showing emotion, all those things afterwards, correct? Yes, he did. And he had told you also um, that when he had placed the bodies in Alabama, he stayed there for a while, didn't he? He did. He said he said he spent some time at the at the site before he left. I think it was about four hours. I believe he, he made it sound like it it was several hours possibly. And he prayed before he left. That's what he said he did. So, Sergeant Creech, the solicitor asked you about your job as an investigator, and you collect the facts, correct? Correct. Whether they're good or bad. That's correct. And you and Tim had a conversation where he asked you to contact his mother to help him figure out what's going on with him, correct? We did, and that was something I never had the time or opportunity to follow up on. You told him you would do that, but you didn't. I did all the questions I have. Okay. Quick follow-up, just real quick, Your Honor. Okay. When, this is new. Mr. Madsen asked you about the voices he heard about mutilating the kids. It's true he was able to ignore those voices and chose not to mutilate them, correct? Correct. Other than cutting on the ton initially. That would be correct. One other question. Mr. Mads brought up the length of time Mr. Jones said he spent there with their bodies but he still left them and left them for the wild, correct? That would be correct. Thank you. Mr. Step down. The um, defense needs a five-minute break, so we'll take 15. <laughs>